So good evening. Thank you all for joining. I'm Victoria uh, from 15 by 4 Munich, and this is a joint uh, event organized by 15 by 4 Munich and Lectures Without Borders. We call our this this webinar series uh, science, uh, science Communication Without Borders, SciComs Without Borders. And today we are very welcome to invite Carolina, who will talk to us about um, so book science. So each event, uh, we invite someone who organizes some science communication, science outreach activities to talk about how they do this, what are their secrets, uh, what difficulties have they overcome. So very much looking forward uh, to the talk tonight. And I will just give over to Carolina that she uh, does the presentation. Welcome, Carolina. Great, thank you. So I'm going to start by sharing my screen. So hopefully you can all see my screen now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, and thank you for inviting me, uh, Victoria. I'm really excited to be here at the intersection of so many cool outreach initiatives to then talk about an initiative that I am part of, so Bog Science. But before I do that, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an introduction about me. Uh, so my name is Carolina Doran, and I have been a researcher for around uh, roughly 10 years. And as many researchers, I've traveled around. So I did my PhD in the UK at the University of Bristol, where I studied um, animal collective behavior. So collective decision making, more specifically in social insects, in ants. And then after quite a few months backpacking in South America, I moved to Berlin, where I'm currently based, to start a postdoc. And in this postdoc, I study still animal collective behavior, uh, but I specifically study uh, the development of collective patterns of behavior in fish. And I'm actually now on maternity leave. So if you hear baby sounds in the background, I apologize. But that's just how it is. We're all stuck at home. <laughs> um, and so at the same time that I, I moved to Germany and I should say that I'm an Alexander von Humboldt fellow and I do my research here at the Leibniz Institute of Freshwater Ecology and Linden Fisheries. And I mentioned these because these are all three institutions that are big supporters of soapbox science. And so when I moved to Germany, I, I decided to bring soapbox science with me. And so currently I'm the co-head of the Berlin soapbox science team. And Let's talk about soapbox science then. What, what it, enough about me. What is soapbox science? And before I tell you in detail what it is, I thought I would show you a little animation video uh, the Berlin uh, Science Week, the Berlin soapbox science team, together with an animation company called Monstros, did um, a year ago. So I'm going to play it for you. What happens if you put some scientists on a busy street? People who don't usually think about science get to hear about it firsthand from scientists who don't have shaggy beards and odd matching shoes, but who do know how to share their passion for experimentation, discovery and innovation. Just some of the world's top women in science, a couple of silly props, a dash of summer showers and lots of unsuspecting passers-by. Developed in London, Soapbox Science builds on the tradition of public speaking at Speaker's Corner in Hyde Park, where people used to stand on wooden crates to share their ideas. We promote women scientists by transforming public areas into a space for learning and scientific debate by mimicking that format. Over the centuries, female researchers have had to work as volunteer faculty members, seen credit for significant discoveries they've made assigned to male colleagues and been left out of textbooks. Even today, when women do graduate from scientific fields of study, they're much less likely than men to work professionally in these fields. So Box Science wants to change that. Our events have reached more than 140,000 members of the public and promoted more than 1,000 women scientists working in several different fields. Have you ever wondered why do we all look different? Do animals have social lives and does it matter? And how many ways can you make a star explode? Come and listen to the best scientists in the world at your hometown by checking our event calendar. Want to join this adventure and become a speaker? Get in touch with Soapbox Science. No team in your city? Gather some friends and start one. Soapbox Science headquarters will guide you along the way. 
Soapbox Science, a unique platform that aims to make a difference. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that. It was for sure great fun preparing this video. Um, but now I'm going to tell you a little bit more detail uh, what the Soapbox Science is about. So it's an outreach platform. And what it does is that brings science to the streets quite literally uh, and highlights the work of women in science, technology, engineering, math, and medicine. And we use an inclusive definition of women and female, and we welcome, very much welcome applications from trans women, gender queer women, and non binary people that, for the purposes of this event, feel comfortable being female identified. And so this was founded by two uh, amazing biologists in, from the UK. So there's Dr. Natalie Petrelli. She's an ecologist uh, who has an interest in global environmental change and how this impacts on biodiversity and ecosystem services. And Dr. Sirian Sumner, who is an evolutionary biology and a behavioral ecologist who specializes in social evolution uh, and social insect behavior. And so they, they started this in 2011 with one event in, Lo in London. So now if we fast forward to 2020, this is how many places now have a Soapbox Science team. So Soapbox Science has reached more than 50 cities in uh, more than uh, 10 countries all around the world. So now if you're thinking, oh no, there's no team in my city. Well, you can do something about that. You can start your own team. And the wonderful Soapbox Science Berlin team that I'm part of will, happy, will be happy to help you along the way. We started a team already in 2017, so we can share with you the struggles we had, the solutions we found. And uh, this is how the team currently looks. And uh, from order of appearance in this picture, we have Alice, Flor, Betty, Dusha, Marta, myself, Julia, who's also here in the audience, I see, uh, Francisca, Francisca again, Anna, and by no surprise, another Francisca. Um, and we, as I said, we're happy to help you get started. But of course, the headquarters in London has a science coordinator, Isla Watson, who is amazing. And she's very helpful to all the local organizing teams. And they help us with, you know, materials, logistics, designs, Anything we, we need, we can just contact with them. They also help with the communication between the different uh, local organizing teams. So we're all just a really big family and it's, it's wonderful to be part of this initiative. Okay, but how does it work? So typically a soapbox science event will take three hours. And what happens is that we pick a central location. Uh, we hopefully pick a very sunny afternoon. We select 12 speakers. So we, we go through a process of selection where speakers can apply and we, the team, select 12. And then we place four soapboxes in the central area and we leave them there for three hours. And we have three rounds of four speakers speaking for an hour simultaneously. At the same time, we recruit a team of 15 to 20 volunteers. And these volunteers help us run the event. So we see here a couple of pictures of very successful events, the entire team, the speakers and the volunteers, and they help us in many different ways. They help speakers with their presentations, like holding props, um, helping with the communication with the public, solving any language barrier uh, issues that might occur. Um, they also help us in collecting data. So we count how many uh, visitors are around. We try and understand how long they visit each speaker for. And we have surveys to, uh, to give visitors when they're about to leave to understand if they learned anything, if they are, were aware of this event before they came or if they were just passing by, and if they were aware that this was an event to promote women in science or not and how they feel about it. So lots of different things we do. So this is how an event, at least here in Berlin, looks like. So uh, in this picture, we were in Tempelhofer Feld and the weather wasn't very nice, but still we had visitors with their umbrellas and it worked really well. And you see here we have a soapbox and the speaker is standing on it, talking about her research. Visitors will sometimes bring their own chairs and sit or they'll just stand around. Uh, of course, there are also speakers who will step out of the soapbox and do their presentation in a more interactive way. We've had speakers that danced, you can sing. It, you know, there's no limits to how you can present. 
The only different, the only different thing is, is that you cannot have a PowerPoint presentation with you. So there's no computer, there's no, not a lot of technology in, 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 the, pres in the place. In the, and the point is to make that the scientist and the public are on not so far from each other. So it's that we're having a conversation and that science should just flow through like the air. You know, it's something we can all talk about it as equal. And of course, this year, uh, the events look a little bit different, as you can see. So we were still able to do it in Berlin, but we had to wear masks, we had to keep a distance. And so our volunteers actually had an extra task to make sure everyone was complying with the safety measures and it worked brilliantly. And, you know, in order to stand in a soapbox and do such a presentation, um, one has to, to learn uh, specific um, presentation skills. So we always organize a speaker's workshop where we, we teach all of this. So the speakers join. So first of all, we can all get to know one another, uh, but we can talk about different uh, presentation techniques, body language, what kind of uh, words are uh, familiar or non-familiar to a lay audience and how to explain these. And we talk about uh, several different things. And sometimes we have uh, invited speakers which are professionals in the, in the field to give us some pointers. As you can expect this year, this again worked a little bit different, but we were still able to do it. We had to do it in a bigger space, again, wear a mask and keep our distance, but we successfully had a speaker's workshop. So after all this work, and thanks to the great generosity of our sponsors, we are able to have a networking dinner at the end of the event. So all the speakers and volunteers and uh, the team members, we all go for dinner together. And this is really great. And uh, new scientific collaborations have come from this. And again, we all get to know one another. We, we can talk about how the event was, how it felt for the speakers to be on the soapbox. It's really always great fun. And I'm sure you saw this one coming that this year we had to do it differently. And I have to say that it was quite nice to have uh, this networking dinner in such a free setting in the park. And we might end up doing this anyway in the future, pandemic or not, because in the end, it's much easier to network and talk to different people when you're not constrained to a square table. So something we've learned from the pandemic. But you know, why soapbox? Why are we standing on soapboxes? So we talked a little bit about this already in the video I showed, but just to tell you a little bit more detail what is happening there. So as the video said, this is based on the speaker's corner in Hyde Park in London. And this itself was a place that was born out of struggle for civil liberties in, in Victorian times in the UK, in Britain. And the establishment of this corner was a significant milestone in the development of their democratic institutions. And so in the late 80s, the parliament granted the park authorities the permits for public meetings. And this is how the speaker's corner was born. So it was already heavy with history and, and, and it was for over a century has been now a focus of protest and debate and the symbol of what a free society and a, a mature democracy should be. So soapbox science is trying to mimic that, that physical format. And it's also echoing society's desire and need to address a more serious issue, that of gender equality. And in this case, particularly in the science profession. So this is how our, also, our soapboxes look like. And so what is our mission? So first of all, as with many science, science outreach platforms, is the science for the masses. We want to address the needs we have as a society to achieve wider participation in science. If anything this year has shown us is that science literacy is so, so important that people, it's so important that people understand how science works um, so they can develop a, a bigger uh, critical thinking uh, ways of, you know, interacting with what we read in the news and so on. Science literacy is really, really important. But again, this isn't new. The second mission and equally important mission of SOPA science is that of promoting the visibility of women in science. Um, so in other words, we want to create role models. We want to challenge the perception people have of who a scientist is. And by doing that, we also want to generate a network of female scientists for mutual empowerment and open the discourse about gender inequality in science. 
because you know numbers are important and we often talk about the numbers of women in science and i will also talk about this in a minute but it there's a lot more to talk about than just numbers numbers are important but not enough which brings me to why women why are we focusing on women and here comes the numbers <laughs> this is a, a graph that shows a very common pattern um, of what happens in women in science so we see when more junior positions like undergraduates, the uh, percentage of women in science is 50-50. And then as we progress to more senior positions to from uh, PhD to postdocs and to full professors, the proportion of women drastically decreases. So this is data from Germany that was taken in 2015. But of course, it's the same, not only in Germany. So here we see the same pattern when we combine data from all the European Union countries. There's a, a more close to 50-50. Actually, in this case, it's even higher for women at the bachelor or master student. And then when we get to full professor, it's again close to 20%. So this is what is called the leaky pipeline. So there's a pipeline that takes us from uh, graduates all the way to full professorships and it's leaky. It's leaky because we're losing women along the way. And this is very sad. Not only it's not fair, but it's also not good for research because gender diversity brings a, brings unique diversity in any way, brings that brings new, uh, unique perspectives to research and it really enriches scientific conversations. So this is one study that is one example that shows that it was only when females joined this research that they found that it wasn't only male birds that, that sang, that female birds were also singing. Sorry, I keep looking to the side because that's where I see you all. I'm going to try not to. <laughs> and if you're interested in stories like this, these are two books that are really well written that talk a lot about these issues and how we do live in a world that was built by men for men. And there's mo many more books about it, but these are two I would highly recommend. Okay, so now everyone's wondering, okay, but why are women living science and what can we do about it? So in the time that I have left, I'd like to focus on these key, three key drivers for this leaky pipeline. And so stereotypes, which are heavily caused by a lack of role models, right? You can't be what you can't see. So we want to talk a little bit about this. And then I want to talk about something called stereotype threat, which is a direct consequence of having stereotypes and how these all combined together leads to the well-known implicit or unconscious bias. So here, this is, these are two quotes from a study that was done in the 50s where uh, secondary school aged children had to write essays about scientists. So they wrote things like, a scientist should not marry. No one wants to marry him. He neglects his family, has no social life, bores his wife. The scientist is a man who wears a white coat, is elderly, bald, wears a beard. So not only people are thinking that, or kids in this case, are thinking that scientists are men, but they have all the stereotypes that they're no fun, they're no social, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know about you. I'm a scientist, I'm a woman, and I'm a lot of fun. So they're wrong on all three counts. And of course, there's this famous draw scientist uh, test that were, were originally developed by David Wade Chambers in the 80s. And again, they were investigating children's percep uh, perception of who a scientist is. And of course, most all kids drew a man. Uh, there was a smaller number than 0.05% of all the, the, the children that drew a female scientist, and those were all girls. So since then, you know, female representation in science has substantially increased and supported by many different initiatives, such as Soapbox Science, uh, to, promote, uh, to promote women in science. And now you see more female scientists um, still outnumbered by male peers, but more frequently appear in textbooks, magazines, and TV shows aimed at children. And so more than 50 years later, you know, nearly around 80 studies have repeated this draw scientist, and a meta-analysis show that at this point, so in 2016, as much as 58% of the, the kids that were asked to draw scientists drew women. So things are getting better. However, unfortunately, as the, the older we get, uh, boys and girls are a lot less likely to draw women 
uh, than they are to draw men. And there have been other studies that also show that girls as young as six will um, use words as genius, excellent to define male traits as, and not female traits. And the parents of those children are a lot more likely to wish their daughters to be a hairdresser or a teacher or their son to be a scientist or an engineer. These are all published papers that I'm happy to share if you want them. Okay, so the problem with these stereotypes is that they lead to something called stereotype threat. And this is uh, the psychological, it's a psychological effect that makes your performance deteriorate when you become aware of which uh, group you belong to. So many studies have shown that this, that this is a fact. So for instance, when you're doing a maths test, if you have to say you're a girl, you will do a lot worse because the stereotype is that girls are no good at maths. And this of course holds true not only for gender, but also race, accents, sexual orientation, age, physical ability, many, many things. And so it's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. The stereotype threat reinforces the stereotype. And in science, the stereotype is that men have greater brilliance potential potential for scientific um, a brilliance and genius. But again, I like to always follow up with the positive and there are several studies like this one that I'm showing here that uh, shows that knowing is half the battle. So what the study did is that they had a, a test, they had three different groups and they provided these groups with a test. So the first group was told that it was a problem solving test and if you see that there's no significant differences between how men and women perform. If you give them the same test, so a different group, you give them the same test, but you call it a maths test, you see that there's a big difference between how men and women perform. Uh, but now, if you give them again the same test, you say it's a maths test, but beforehand you have a little workshop where you talk about stereotype threat and explain its dangers. Then with this awareness, again, men and women do not perform that differently. So knowing is half the battle, not, not the full battle, but it's half the battle. And of course, all of these combine to lead to what we call this implicit bias, which is a cognitive process which influences our judgments, actions, and performance. So it's basically an unconscious tendency to negatively assess a person's ability to perform a particular task merely because they belong to, to a certain group and not based on any information on that individual, no facts about that individual. And of course, this is triggered by our brain making quick judgments and assessments. And there are evolutionary advantages to our, our brain making these shortcuts, right? We, when, we wanna, when we label something as dangerous, we don't want to have to recalculate it all the time. We want to be able to act next time we, we, we encounter this dangerous situation. But of course, it can also lead to sub optimal decisions. And the problem here is that these stereotypes and their, their threats and the lack of role models, they, they just perpetuate um, these implicit biases. And then women receive fewer invitations to conferences, are less cited, and are awarded less funding than their male counterparts. And, you know, not only, we all have this, it's not only men, everyone has implicit biases. I have implicit bias, we, you all have implicit biases and we will be forever more working on it and work on it, we should. So this is a study that shows that, both, so they, they interviewed or monitor people in a natural history museum and they could see that both mothers and fathers are a lot more likely to explain scientific facts to their sons than they are to their daughters. And you know, there's also a lot of scientific studies showing how scientists also have these biases. Even if we work on it and we, we know about it, we are still susceptible to them. And it's important to remember that we need to, to take active action for it. So we could follow examples, for instance, like the famous pasta company Barilla. They have now a, a, a diversity and inclusion department and all their workers go on uh, frequently diversity training. And if you Google their example, it's, it's a really, really optimist view of what one can achieve if we do this. I think uh, academics have to follow on this idea and also start doing diversity and inclusion training, which already answers my, my question now, how can we break this loop? So we need to train ourselves to increase our, our awareness and those around us. And of course, we need to create role models. And what better way to do that than to get involved with soapbox science? And there are many ways you can do that. So 
If you're in Berlin, if you would like to be part of our amazing network of supporters and sponsors, just get in touch, you can. Uh, the call for speakers for this, uh, this year is already open. So if you want to participate as a speaker, check if the city you are in has a team and if they are running an event. A lot of us still don't have a fixed date or, or location, but this information will come very soon. And again, if there's no team in your city, it's a perfect opportunity to start one. And there's lots of help out there, so you're not alone. There will be a lot of support for this. And keep an eye out also for calls for volunteers. That's also a fun way to participate. Every team recruits volunteers, including the Berlin team, and we would be happy to welcome you. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for listening. And in the name of the Berlin uh, Soapbox Science team, I'd like to wish you happy holidays. And I would be happy to answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Carolina. We are open for questions. So guys, please feel free. We're a pretty small group, so you can just switch on your microphone and ask a question. And maybe I start, uh, since everyone is feeling a bit shy, maybe. Um, questions are, I think, always the same that we start with, because they are always important. How uh, did you find the money? Also, maybe how much money does it require to run a soapbox science in a city? Uh, is it uh, every year that you need a lot of money? Or is it just for initial start? What was your experience with this? So, of course, the more money you have, the more you can do. And at the moment, for the, the Berlin um, team, the most expensive thing is the networking dinner. And you can for sure run an event without it. It's just such a privilege that we can have this. And this co costs roughly between 500 to 1,000 euros. So that's by far the most expensive thing we have. And then you need to pay for the location because it come, you know, there's insurances and all these things behind. Um, and that in Berlin costs roughly 100, 200 euros, depends on what you want to do. Everything but did else- you, Sorry, can I interrupt you here? Did you pay for okay. locations like in the park or like public places? Yes, you yeah. had to pay, oh my God. We had to pay. Of course we could show up and do it, <laughs> but then <laughs> if the park authorities come up, you know that it, it is still an event. So we didn't mm. have to pay because of insurance reasons. Interesting. Um, yeah, and then everything else we kind of, got sponsorship not through money but with direct materials you know the lab coats were given by the IGB the soap boxes were made to us by Helweg um you know this year we decided to have new t-shirts I you know see yeah. and <laughs> this we, <laughs> we had to get a, a specific sponsor for it it's actually a very cheap event to run because you don't need much and then of course uh, because it's such a great event there's a lot of institutions wanting to support it and then there's a lot more you can do you know, we want to get sign language interpreters to be there, which is something quite expensive. So we're, we're working to get the funding for this. There's so much one can do. That's a really cool idea. Well, um, I can say from a bit from Munich perspective. So I, I, I started the Soapbox Science in Munich. Uh, I'm not involved in the last couple of years, so I might not be super updated. But as far as I remember from our first time, which was in 2018, I think, um, we didn't need to pay, uh, so the city allowed us. I don't know if that was that they took any cost on themselves. I guess they kind of insurance covered the insurance themselves. But in Munich, um, you need to register officially with the city that you will take certain space. You also need to agree that there is no overlapping activities, but mm -hmm. otherwise it was for free. Um, yeah, and but I also agree that this is a pretty cheap event to run and maybe initial start requires some investment. For us, the soap boxes actually were a bit tricky to find who makes them. And each of them, I think, costed several hundred um, euros. But then we made mm -hmm. them once. The next question was where to keep them. But as long mm -hmm. as yes. there is a place, that's all right. And yeah, many things like lab coats you can reuse. Uh, probably you want to make new shirts for new volunteers, but that is not so expensive. And maybe you get the same volunteers come again, then they already have a t-shirt. <laughs> we actually and were a little bit more cheeky than that. And we initially, we would just get the volunteers to wear the t-shirts and return them 
because oh. we had the networking dinner anyway as a big reward at the end so okay. we thought this was okay i also agree i think this event is pretty easy to sponsor through uh, academic organizations because they all have some budget for science outreach activities and even like of course depends where you live yes but what your city is but if you have several uh, institutions like research institutions and universities and you get uh, 500 to 1000 euros from each then you will easily fund it and next year will be even cheaper um, yeah. yeah we also were doing like our I think costs were what Carolina mentioned we also had some catering for the workshop uh, for the speakers workshop but our networking dinner was actually smaller we only invited the core team and the speakers but not all mm -hmm. the volunteers but i think that this idea of the having a picnic is pretty cool and also yeah. can be run low cost right you can invite people to bring their own food and mostly benefit of meeting and yeah. not getting a free dinner exactly. yeah we actually did provide the food still mm. uh, because it was a last minute, oh no, we're in a pandemic, let's not go to a restaurant, how do we solve this? It was good weather, so we, we decided to just sit in a park. But as you say, it can also be done low cost. It's also, it's, it's a incremental thing, you know, the first year we did it, no one knew about it. So it was really hard to get sponsors and speakers and each of us from the team talked to our own institutes and we got something going. But as, as the time goes by and you get more famous because it's a really cool, designed event it becomes easier to get sponsorship and then you're thinking okay we need to up our game and do more cool things because we have all these amazing institutions wanting to support us sure nice mm. any questions ready from the audience marina yeah I have... hi oh sorry okay go ahead yeah uh, i wanted to ask how do you choose the, the time for your event uh, and how how do you find so many uh, speakers for one day? Well, it's a lot. No? <laughs> okay, so the first question, uh, the date, we try to choose the day in the summer because we want to have lots of people walking around. So the whole point of the event is to get those people that weren't going to go to a science event, those that are not prone to, and to surprise them with science is cool. And so uh, we try to hope for good weather, but so roughly spring, summer, and we do it in the afternoon, you know, and try to choose an area where people will be passing by already. And how do we get many speakers? Well, we have a lot of people on our team focusing on social media. That's a really big way of doing it. But we also email, we have a, a list of all the research institutions in Germany and we email them all a few times a year. And we roughly get around 50 applicants every year, 50 to 60. I can I maybe I can add from Munich experience. We also always could select speakers, so we always had more applications than twelve. Not such crazy number as far as I remember. Maybe first year we had like twice as many as as places, but it was not particularly difficult. But again, depends where you live and if there are several institutions in the city or cities close by where people can come from. Like we also had people coming from other cities in Bavaria, which are one, two hours drive. And for the event date, uh, we always had Saturday because yeah, this is same. a day where people are outside, but mm -hmm. not Sunday. <laughs> so on Sunday in Bavaria, nothing works. So people are <laughs> not in the city, they are in the mountains. So, and we wanted a day when they will be in the city and then we would also we would try to check as early as possible with the city of munich uh, um, what are the possible locations and dates and then pick from this and as carolina said summer is the best because the chances are higher that the weather will be good <laughs> hassan you wanted to ask something right yeah uh, okay so i uh, actually have like a few questions First, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it seems like a nice project. And uh, I have a few questions uh, for you. So um, uh, the first one uh, probably is already answered, but I was uh, I was wondering if you have like um, a kind of a universal day that uh, all 
like all organizers in different cities will set this day for this event to happen in the different locations, but obviously it's not the case where you you basically select the date like each, each, each city on its own. Yeah, whatever works better for each city. Yeah. I mean, the, okay. the summer is not even in the same season everywhere, so some events are happening in parts of the world where it's winter for us. Right? Yeah, I see. Um, so my second question is, um, how could you or how can you now uh, reach out to uh, like to grab an audience to your event or uh, like spread the word in your city? So we do a lot, a lot. You mean now as in with the pandemic or in general? No, in general, yeah. Uh, in general, yeah. We do a lot of social media. So a lot of the, the, the work is on social media. So Twitter, uh, Facebook and Instagram. But what exactly you do, Caroline, if, if you know, I don't know if you, how much are you involved? Yeah, Just having so, a page and posting there is not enough, right? You need to also promote your post somehow. Uh, well, we happen to have uh, very members on our team that are very good with social media and already have a lot, a lot of followers and are also part of other outreach initiatives. And so our posts tend to reach quite a, a wide audience. Mm -hmm. And you know, uh, since a few years now, we've been able also to sponsor people to travel to Berlin for to become a speaker, and then they also start re reposting our posts. And like this, it really gets quite wide. So from our so because we have these uh, surveys, uh, the questionnaires at the end of the event, a lot of people were there that didn't know they were going to be there. They didn't know about the event, but those that did found out through social media quite a lot of the time. Okay, so just like one final question about uh, the organization of the event. You mentioned you have uh, four speakers per uh, per hour. So mm -hmm. I was just wondering if they are like, uh, if this is happening in parallel or each speaker has like 15 minutes. That's a good question. It's something I should have said I have, and I forgot. So the way it happens is that speakers, they will prepare something like around 15 minutes and then they will just repeat themselves for this hour. And they tend to repeat themselves three, sometimes four times, normally three. And so if you're someone, a member of the audience, you get to travel around and see every hour and you normally get to see all speakers. And this allows also for some speakers to change the language they're presenting so they can do it once in German and then once in English. And so. <clears throat> yeah, okay, thank you. Victoria, so you were mentioning you're part of the Soapbox in Munich. Um, I was a founder, but I'm not part of it anymore. Okay, is anyone actually in Munich in Soapbox? Yeah, there are. Um, yes, yeah. I can I can put you in touch with the team if um, it, they're also in email. I let me. They're let me also look it up. on Facebook. Yeah, you can also find or them on Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. Yeah, but like, uh, so let's say, is it mainly one event per year that where you look for speakers, and throughout the year there would not be any possibilities to participate otherwise? It depends, you know, so for in Berlin, we always actually do two. We do one as part of the Berlin Science Week. And I know that you sometimes also with the Munich, you have co-organized with other outreach events. So the thing we always organize the big one in the summer, but teams can do whatever they want. And if they have the time, I mean, yeah, there's no limit to how many events. It's just time consuming and everyone is volunteer based. So. This year, everything is tricky uh, mm. and works very weirdly. <laughs> Normally, Katya, I would tell you, uh, you should yeah, contact Soapbox Science Munich um, on Facebook and also 15 by 4 Munich. It's another organization that I'm part of. I can write in the chat the title. They, the 15 by 4 Munich would normally have monthly events with four speakers each. So it's quite a lot of speakers that they need per year. Um, right now, the events are paused because they, we tried to do online and it didn't really work so well. So we are waiting when it all goes back, but there, then they will need more speakers. Um, and there is also Pint of Science, which also has events once per year, uh, but they have multiple events and they also are looking for speakers. Okay, cool. And if you are able to speak German, there are even more events that you can find <laughs> in Munich. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> Communication level. 
Yeah, for for English, fifteen by four so box pint of science. Um, there is also something called Munich Science Slam, which I don't think what's going to happen, but you can find them on Facebook and follow and see maybe they do organize something again. Yeah, sorry that I <laughs> kind of interrupted here. Why, like Carlini also do posters, and I I felt you yeah. do a pretty good job. They were even reaching Thank Munich, uh, wow. and I saw it in my institute and was like, "Where are Berlin posters here and not Munich poster?" <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> yes, we we have a, a one of our sponsors who gives the time of the of their graphic designer and. Yeah, so the first year we actually printed a lot of posters and then we decided to be a bit more environmental friendly. And so it, it, it's a digital poster. So we send it around to all institutions and then most of institutions will also uh, amplify through their social media. So that's another way where we reach for even Munich. And we have also postcards and bookmarks actually. Do you, how do you spread them? Do you do you send them to someone and just give to people? So in the event, we give to people that are interested and want to, to keep in touch, but we all the team also use our own network and yeah. Hmm. In Munich, we had uh, tattoos, you know, the uh -huh. uh, temporary, that was pretty cool. I think kids liked it also. You also have wonderful pens. I, I don't have mine here that the Munich team gave us oh. as a present. Nice, oh, I'm here. happy you like it. Here it is. Look at that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <Bingo>. <laughs> cool. More more questions from the audience? Yes, I wanted to ask one more question uh, about languages, because you said about it. Uh, you you showed the you showed the map and it was a lot of countries. There is any rules in which language uh, Mm, you can use, for example, uh, you do it in English, yeah? No, we do we do both. Actually, mm. we were so we were once criticized because in Berlin the most spoken languages by order are German, English, and Turkish, and we try to cater for all of this, but it's not always easy because you know there are a lot of minorities in research and we can't always find enough scientists to speak for all these languages but i you know each country does it or each city does it in their own way um in in berlin and and as in munich as me and victoria were discussing earlier there there's a big international community and therefore we cannot do it only in german and most of the researchers also will not speak german so we do it in a mix but i know in argentina and in, in Tucumán and in Rio in Brazil and Sao Paulo they do it in their mother tongues also in Sweden so I think there's no recipe you, you can do it however works where you are the one thing we do is that if you are going to do it in English and that's not the, the language of the country you're in it's important to have volunteers that can speak both languages so they can help with whatever language barriers might might occur Okay, now I understand. Yeah. Because you know, sometimes because... a lot of people will understand English, but feel like they can't ask a question in English, and they would rather do it in their own language. And then it's important to have someone who can help. Yeah, because it's often that researchers came from the other yeah. countries and don't speak mm -hmm. the language of the country where they are. Yeah. Okay. And so for science, it's, yeah, yeah, it's both for the audience, but also it's it's an empowerment thing. It's also for the speaker. So we wouldn't refuse anyone based on what languages they can speak. Okay. Thank you, I understood. <laughs> more questions? I always have more questions. Uh, how is your teamwork organized? This is also very important. Uh, how maybe it also developed through time? Did you start with a very small team and mm -hmm. then grew? What do you use to communicate internally? Any tips that you could give to other people? Yeah, this is definitely was definitely a challenge. We started with a small team and still, you know, there were those who were really excited and did most of the work and those who didn't do much and it, the communication wasn't always amazing. And so what we do now is that, and it works really well, the team grew a lot as you could see in the picture. Um, we have a task list. 
So we, we before the year starts, we list everything that needs to be done and we divide this as evenly as we possibly can. And, you know, we decide that person A is responsible for these tasks, which doesn't mean that this person has to do it alone, but we know that that person is responsible to make sure it happens. So that, you know, it's, it's a more egalitarian division of labor. And so far this has been working for us. So we have those that are responsible for social media and those that are responsible with the contact with the headquarters and the speakers. And then those that are responsible with dealing with the bureaucracies behind getting the location and insurance and which again doesn't mean these people do only that we all do a bit of everything but that person will be the one that you know if i'm speaking if i'm the one responsible with communicating with the speakers and there's a day there's lots of emails and i can answer it's my responsibility to go hey can someone go can you go on the email and respond because today i can't so i still have to make sure it happens but it doesn't mean i have to take all the load myself. And this is working very well for us at the moment. And we meet once well, at the moment via Zoom, but once a month uh, to, to discuss all of this. And closer to the event, we end up having to meet a, a little bit more often. What technical tools do you use? Do you use something like a Slack or something else to organize for Yes, discussion? we have Slack. Slack and mm -hmm. we share a lot of things on Google Drive. How, how do you, you said you are co-head, so you, there are more than one head and how do you divide the labor between those? Or how uh, so do you see your me. functionality? Yeah, so it's me and Marta. And so what we do is that before every meeting, we, we discuss together what we think are the things that are pressing and they need to be discussed before. Uh, we we have a in our drive we have a document with the meeting minutes and we you know before every meeting we make sure everything that needs to be discussed is there and we are the ones who either me or her who are in contact with the headquarters and yeah, it just means that me and her we talk a little bit more often than all of us meeting we kind of oversee a little bit of everything so even if we're not responsible for any number of tasks, we still make sure that they are happening. And mm. yeah, but it, it, we have such a good team that it's actually, we end up not having to do this a lot. <laughs> that sounds cool. How, why do you have two people? Why um, is it historical reasons or other? It kind of naturally happened. And, you know, mm. I'm on maternity leave also. So I, I had to step down a little bit. So in the end, this last year, which was a more challenging one, Marta ended up coordinating it mostly by herself. Mm. Um, but a little bit before that, it kind of naturally happened that we were doing this. We just didn't name it like that. So in the end, we made it official. <laughs> I see. Cool. Thank you so much. Uh, I think at this point, we will stop recording, which I am going to do right now.